Welcome to Dialogue This Week. In this corner, we invite guests from in and out of Korea to talk about a wide variety of issues, ranging from culture and sports to the latest trends around the world. Now, we are just a week away from the opening of the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. And with two years of the pandemic already behind us, Beijing is bracing itself for the arrival of thousands of Olympians, officials and support staff, including from countries where the highly transmissible Omicron variant is raging. Now, in order to limit the spread of the infection, China is sealing the entire games inside a so-called closed loop system, a bubble completely cut off from the rest of the city. The bubble is welcoming an estimated 11,000 people from around the world. And to give you a brief summary of how the bubble works, anyone entering the bubble must be fully vaccinated or face an additional 21-day quarantine upon arrival in Beijing before being allowed into the bubble. And once inside the bubble, participants will be tested every day and must wear face masks at all times. And what's more startling is that the high stakes for everyone who catches COVID. Participants who test positive will be immediately removed from the games. So will China be able to keep the games COVID with the COVID-19 safe? And what specialities will this year's Olympic have? For answers to this, we have Ben Cowling, Chair Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Hong Kong, and Yu Ji Ho, sports writer at Yonhap News Agency, both via Skype. Thank you for coming on. Hi. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, Dr. Cowling, if we can start with a myth buster, uh, two years into the global COVID-19 pandemic, and there's a lot of confusion over whether it's easier for viruses to spread in the winter time because more people stay indoors and ventilate less because of the cold, or that it spreads less because the air is drier in winter. Can you set the record straight for us. How does weather play into the situation comparing to, you know, last year's Summer Olympics to the upcoming Winter Olympics, Winter Games? I think, yeah, I think we, we know that in general viruses spread a little bit better in the winter, but COVID can actually spread pretty well at any time of the year. We do know for viruses like COVID, they prefer slightly to spread in cooler weather, the viruses prefer it when it's cool and dry. Uh, for ourselves, our mucous membranes tend to dry out a little bit when it's drier and when it's cold as well. And so that puts us at higher risk of getting infected if there's virus around. And then as you mentioned, people spend more times indoors when it's cold, more time in crowded conditions when it's cold. And so all of these factors together mean that we do see more transmission. And that's gonna be a risk for the Winter Olympics. They're gonna spend a lot of time indoors. And if there's just one case, in the room, in the venue, that's going to be a risk of an outbreak for sure. So we should take all the more, take more precautions during this Winter Games. So, um, and on Sunday, the Beijing Olympic Committee and Chinese authorities announced the lowering of threshold for producing a negative COVID-19 test for athletes arriving for the event. Now, the cycle threshold value was lowered from 40 to 35. What exactly is this cycle threshold and what do these numbers actually mean? The cycle threshold is a number that we get out of the PCR test and a lower CT value actually means a higher viral load. Generally for people that are diagnosed early in the illness with COVID, their CT value could be in the 20, sometimes even less than 20. And then as the illness progresses, the viral load might go up a little bit and then it will tend to decline slowly. And when we find CT values above 35, that's low viral loads and it tends to be when people are recovering. And what this means for the Olympics is fortunately, some people who arrive in Beijing may be recovering from COVID. Maybe they had COVID a month earlier. They've still got a little bit of virus in their body. They're not contagious. And under the previous rule, those people would have been disqualified and sent to hospital for isolation for, for maybe two or three weeks. Under the new rule, they're okay. They can continue to the Olympic Village. They can compete. They don't pose a risk to the other competitors. So I think that's a good move. Now let's bring Chiho into the conversation. So with a week left until the opening ceremony, when is the deadline for countries to announce their status of participation for the Olympics? And so far, what countries have confirmed their boycott? Well, the deadline to submit all the uh, athletic entries fell on Monday this week. So we can, uh, we can confirm that there will be 91 countries, uh, nearly 2,900 athletes competing uh, for a record 109 gold medals 
in seven sports in Beijing and around Beijing during the Winter Olympics. Now, in terms of boycotts, uh, if you're just talking about the diplomatic boycotts, in terms of countries not sending their official government delegations, um, the U.S. obviously leading the way for a few other countries, Canada, Australia, Belgium, Britain, Lithuania, New Zealand, and I believe the latest might, might have been Denmark uh, joining uh, the U.S. and a few other countries in, turn, in not sending official delegations to Beijing. But uh, in terms of just participating in action on the, on the slopes, uh, snow and ice, uh, there will be 91 countries, with an exception of uh, North Korea, which was actually banned from the, by the IOC from competing in the Winter Games this time after skipping the Tokyo Games last summer. Right. Then, um, as a sports correspondent yourself, what can you say is different about this year's Winter Olympics in comparison to previous um, Winter Games, where, whether it be due to COVID-19 or other changes to the event itself? Well, everything. You know, this is the first Winter Games held during the pandemic. And obviously, some of us, like myself, had some experience with the, uh, the Summer Games in the pandemic. But this is a different game. We've got a new threat in the form of uh, the Omicron uh, variant and obviously the, the uh, rapid spread of the virus, uh, this variant in a lot of the other parts of the world. Um, there will be a lot more restrictions in terms of uh, the health and safety protocols. Uh, you mentioned daily testing earlier, uh, you know, with all the participants. And basically there will be a lot of things that Winter Olympic athletes have not experienced in previous games. And uh, talking about also the competition itself, there will be some new medal events, including men's and women's uh, big air freestyle skiing, uh, monobob in women's uh, bobsleigh, uh, mixed team competitions in freestyle skiing aerials, ski jumping and snowboard cross, and finally mixed relay event in short track speed skating. So there's a lot of things to look forward to. Now, uh, let's go back to Professor Cowling. Different countries have different vaccine mandates for minors. Now, the COVID-19 requirements set out by the Beijing Olympics organizers requires those not fully vaccinated isolate for three weeks upon arrival in China before entering the closed-loop management system of the event. But uh, there are exceptions to this requirement, including those with medical conditions or athletes under 18 whose home country has yet to approve vaccinations for minors for example, Russia. So uh, how do you think these factors might play into the possible risks at the event? Well, I, I think ideally it would be great if every arriving athlete could be quarantined for at least 14 days because we know that's a very effective way to keep infections out of the community, in this case, out of the Olympic Village. But in reality, athletes aren't, aren't going to be able to do that. They often come in just for their event and then leave again. So I, I don't think that the, the, the lack of quarantine for minors is going to be a big issue. What is actually going to be a big issue is a lot of the other competitors who are fully vaccinated, adults, of course, uh, coming into the Olympic Village without any quarantine. Uh, I think so far about 1.5% of arriving people uh, for the Olympics have tested positive on arrival. I think that there'll be uh, another at least 1% or 2% of people who, who become positive during the, their stay in the Olympic Village. And that's just the infections that were present before arrival. If there's any transmission in the Olympic Village, then, of course, there could be even more infections. So I, I think the minors is a minor issue. I, I think the big issue is actually that people are coming in without quarantine. And I do worry that some athletes are going to have their, their events spoiled. They're going to be sent to isolation because they test positive, unfortunately. And that's going to be a shame for, for them. Well, we will have to wait uh wish for the best. But um, as we've mentioned earlier, this closed loop management system includes rigorous COVID-19 countermeasures that have been put in place for the Winter Olympics. So uh, once within the loop, all athletes and personnel will have to take daily COVID-19 tests and will not be able to access the outside world during their time in Beijing. So um, Chi Ho, can you remind us uh, how conditions were different for athletes at the recent Tokyo Summer Olympics that were also held amid the pandemic? Right. I, I, think, I think things were a little less restrictive uh, back in Tokyo. Uh, you know, with the rules being laid out by Beijing, right, it sounds like this is going to be a far different experience for them uh, coming into uh, these Olympic Games. Now, after 14 days in Tokyo, uh, things are loosened up a little bit for all the participants. Uh, you could you know, take maybe public tran transit, kind of get out in town a little bit, maybe venture out. 
Uh, but there will be no such thing in Beijing. Uh, they will be in, in the bubble, inside the bubble the whole time during their stay. Uh, but some of the other elements that Beijing is bringing back from Tokyo, maybe taking the cues from Tokyo, is that uh, the athletes will, I guess, be uh, recommended or, I guess, kind of supposed to leave the country entirely within maybe 48 hours of the end of the competition. Um, you know, if you look at some of the past Olympics, a lot of the athletes who were done early in, in the in the in the games, they would kind of stay back, you know, maybe to see the city a little bit and go to different games and cheer on athletes from their own countries and kind of attend different sports just for just for the fun of it. But uh, there will be no such thing allowed uh, in Beijing, just as it was, just as was the case in Tokyo in last year. Then what about for spectators? The Tokyo Summer Olympics were essentially held behind closed doors. So what about for the Beijing Olympics? Will fans be allowed in? And will, we, will you yourself be at the event? Well, I'm traveling myself, in fact, on Monday um, to, to Beijing. I'm, I guess I'm walking into a bubble myself. Now, in terms of the spectators, uh, pretty much the same deal. Uh, no tickets will be sold to the general public in China. Uh, they, they will, quote unquote, invite a select few people into some of the some of the events. Uh, the last I heard was uh, some of the civil servants and university students in the area will be allowed to attend. But the, again, there will be a lot of restrictions too. Uh, no vocal cheering, uh, no singing, uh, uh, no very uh, li limited the physical uh, interactions within themselves when when they are watching uh, these events. So it will be very eerie, uh, very quiet uh, compared to obviously other winter games held before the pandemic. Well, we will have to hope to talk to you after your experience there. Now, um, under these restrictions, Michael Ryan, the emergencies director for the WHO, expressed confidence in the prevention measures implemented by the Olympics organizers and did not foresee any increased risk of transmission. And Beijing has strictly forbidden any contact between the event participants and the Beijing public to the extent that passersby are not allowed to help, even if they see an Olympic vehicle crash. So how do you see things as a health expert, um, Professor Cowling? Uh, I, I'm worried because Omicron is such a challenge. Just a handful of cases of Omicron in the Olympic Village could cause havoc. Unfortunately, we know how quickly it can spread, but I know athletes will themselves be being very cautious about things. Uh, so I hope that there won't be too many infections in the Olympic Village, and I hope that, that a, only a small number of athletes will ultimately uh, uh, be disappointed and unable to compete. As for the city of Beijing, I think the barrier between the Olympic bubble and the city of Beijing is, is pretty good. I don't know if it's going to be perfect, but it's pretty good. And I think that there'll be a minimal number of, of infections spreading into the city of Beijing. Um, if they're lucky, maybe none. Uh, if they're unlucky, maybe a handful. And in, in China, they're very, very good at stopping outbreaks in the community with their lockdowns, mass testing, and so on. So I don't think it's a, a threat as such to the city of Beijing. But in the Olympic Village, I am worried because Omicron is, is really difficult to stop. Now, just briefly before we let you go, um, Chiho, what events and rising stars would you like to highlight for the upcoming Olympics? I think for Korean fans, they will most, mostly uh, watch uh, short track speed skating. This is an event where Korea has been the most successful country in the Winter Games history. Uh, 24 gold medals, 48 medals overall so far. And I think, uh, you know, if Korea were to win maybe a couple of gold medals, most likely they would come from short track. And Cha Min Jung, the two time gold medalist from Pyeongchang four years ago, who once again favored to win uh, a couple of medals herself. And uh, up and coming 20 year old skater Yi Yubin uh, might, uh, might be in for a surprise uh, in Beijing also. Um, on the slopes, uh, Yi Sang Ho, the, the reigning silver medalist in men's parallel giant slalom in the alpine snowboarding, is looking, is looking pretty good. Uh, he's a World Cup points leader so far, and uh, he's, in, he's in good form uh, going into the second straight Olympics. Okay, we will have to look forward to it. Well, I'm afraid we will have to wrap up our show at this point. Thank you so much for making time for us, Professor Cowling and Chi Ho. We'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.